<laughs> um, so, uh, welcome to uh, this uh, talk today, which is on the vernacular of protest. Um, so let's just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of like have a couple of like um, descriptions of protest. So Tate, the art of uh, dot, 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 podcast that they've got, they've got one on, on protest and they set things off by saying it's a way to explode the conversation. Um, and then recently, just in October, um, Whitechapel uh, Public Publishing had one of their documents of contemporary art out and it was on activism edited by um, Afonso Diaz Ramos and Tom Snow. And that set out that artists have consistently engaged in activist discourse, lending their skills to social movements and regularly participating in civil and social right campaign while also boycotting uh, cultural institutions and exerting significant pressure on them. From ACT UP and its affiliate groups since the dawn of the AIDS crisis to the counter spectacle and street theatrics of the Arab Spring and Occupy to ongoing protest movements such as Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall and Decolonize This Space. As, um, as Activist aesthetics have proved uh, increasingly difficult to define under traditional classifications. Um, so today's conversation, um, and I do want it to be a conversation, is uh, an opportunity to come together and explore and unpack and share what we think about um, when we talk about the language or the vocabulary of protest. Um, and I want to try and resist a little bit the usual shape of this kind of an event. I've worked in academia admin branch and uh, run hundreds of events while working at various charities and I'm really always interested in the practical ways um, that we can try and resist the way things are normally done. Um, so I'm interested in the concept of unconference um, that sets out to resist hierarchical forms of event delivery, um, ways to prioritise conversation over presentation um, that often looks, this often like looks to shift the physical setup of conferencing to have things in the round uh, which we and try and not have a panel on a dais above the audience like talking down. So we've got that a little bit, um, but some of like Lois Weaver's um, uh, ideas around how to um, develop Italian dialogue frameworks in order to democratize and enhance cross-class and cross-disciplinary communication, we can't quite kick off because I'd have had to tell you all about it in advance and get you to engage in that sort of way. Um, so. I haven't been able to do the practical planning to facilitate that today, but we'll still try some different things. Um, I want everybody in the room to know that you will play a part in this. Um, it's not just about people on the panel. Um, it doesn't mean you have to speak. Um, it isn't about forcing participation. Uh, but because it's about prioritising conversation, um, and I think conversation around process and practice, I want to hear about your experience of protest um, and art. Uh, or adjacent to art, either in your practice or in work that speaks to you. Um, so when we, if you, I'm going to get questions throughout. We're not going to wait until the end to ask questions. Um, so if you've got a burning thing you want to jump in, um, please do. Please wait for us to pass a performance microphone to you so that Carl can capture it. Um, uh, but yeah, we're going to try and kind of do, do it in that kind of way. Uh, I've made a lot of short videos for charities over, the, over time for like different kinds of issues around sex worker rights or the hostile environment or school exclusion and I tend to see those um, as opportunities as stepping off points and I think that's what today's about, um, you know, like that's what we're sort of like looking to do. So I'm going to introduce our guests um, and um, yeah, Eddie Clark is an artist and a researcher. The focus of her multimedia-based artistic work lies on transfer, transformation of the physical body in an increasingly digitally mediated and experienced world. Ellie is entering the final stages of her PhD at Goldsmiths, University of London, entitled My Body Is My Body Out of Date? The Drag of Physicality in the Digital Age. And Josh Hall is a writer, editorial director, and artist publisher. He runs Possible Worlds, an independent um, publishing house and project space in Great Yarmouth. Possible Worlds is interested in the end of capitalism and the beginning of what? Um, my background, I've studied art and protest for my PhD research. I was looking at two pieces of art that were informed and shaped by protest, even if they weren't actively doing the same sort of job as the actual original events. Um, the first was Della's Battle of Orgrief, a reenactment um, with a reenactment society of a contemporary battle between state and subjects, police and minors, that wouldn't normally be reenacted. And then Graham Miller's Linked, um, which was the reinsertion of people's stories and lives back into a space where they'd been compulsory, compulsory purchased out of in the building of the M11 Link Road. 
Um, my own history with protests is that um, I kind of, in my teenage years, was spent in squats. Uh, I had a lot of people who were involved with um, the criminal justice bill, with um, poll tax riots, like um, th that sort of space. So I was um, involved uh, in protest in that, in that sort of way and made very nervous by it, actually. I, I, find, I find going to protests, the traditional, like, walk quite quite nerve-wracking um, as a result of some of those experiences when I was really young. Um, yeah. Okay. What about, what about you, Ellie? What's like your experiences with protests? Hilarious. It's like a prop. Um, yeah, so uh, my mum's in the room, actually, because I'm from Colchester, so here I am, and uh, I got taken as a kid dressed up in sort of various twigs and things uh, for campaigning against the deforestation, rainforests. Um, so it was introduced at quite a young age to protests and to the idea of resistance and, you know, uh, the status quo being something you can question. Um, as an artist, so I work with performance, photography, uh, video, kind of... Um, I suppose, and also community-engaged projects, and I suppose what I see as a kind of form of like micro-politics of kind of using art as a way to kind of shed a different light on things that are there to help kind of people see a different way or to also particularly to bring people together. Um, and I suppose it's easier if I give some examples. So a very early project I did probably 20 years ago was actually with my former neighbours in the ex-local authority building I lived in in East London, uh, where I realised there was, because of the architecture of the building, there was so little interaction. It was 2002 to three, so it was like 20 years ago now. Um, but how we we're increasingly able to be in touch with people far away, but increasingly didn't know our neighbours. So I basically circulated a disposable camera around the building and invited people to take a photo looking north, a photo looking south, and a photo of what they wanted, and then got funding from the Tenants the Residents Association to put on an exhibition and hand printed these photographs because they were 35 mil. Um, and, and everybody came together in a gallery just up the road that nobody, one person from the building had been in before. And that's the kind of, I suppose, that's a form of sort of protest is sort of from the wrong side, I suppose it's, yeah, but it sort of does the same thing. It brings people together and people then, um, as she talked about that project for kind of 10, 15 years after I'd actually moved out of there. Um, and then through my drag performance, I see drag, I'm through my PhD, I'm looking at drag, um, sort of as a starting point is what we've learned from gender for, uh, through drag drag performance, what happens if we apply that to looking at archives or looking at templates that kind of snap us into grid in the, in the digital kind of physical environments that we live in, this sort of oscillating online, offline space. Um, and through Sajina, she is a, drag, a mobile phone obsessed drag queen who's been around for 12 years, emerged out of parties in Berlin where I lived for 10 years. Um, and writes songs about kind of mobile phones and loneliness and desire and lust in the digital age and is also played by other people. So she's an open source character. So the idea that kind of physicality can be kind of uh, worn or a sort of identity can be worn on different bodies. Um, and in a way she becomes a kind of um, relatable, vulnerable character in this kind of, or subject, digital subject. Um, who still has a body, and that body needs feeding, and that body needs to earn money. And so over COVID, uh, she sort of started doing, like, seminars come webinars about relationship advice that was also turned into a kind of recruitment drive to try and get other people to do these ridiculous webinars. So my work has actually become much more um, about actually labour and, and the kind of... The, and I look at drag as both a, a sort of a dragging up as in a sort of performance and also dragging down a burden. And that's where I'm seeing the body between these various things. So, yeah. And Josh, what, what would you say about protest? Um, I think that protest is more or less the heart of everything that I'm trying to do with Possible Worlds. Um, protest in the sense of trying to create something better, but also protest in the sense of reacting to very specific um, environmental social circumstances, especially in the place that we operate in, which is Great Yarmouth, which has a, uh, you know, its own geographical specificities, its own demographic specificities. Um, most recently, that's manifested in things like public information campaigns in the town about stop and search. Um, there's a large Portuguese community in Great Yarmouth who are utterly disenfranchised within the town. 
um, and we've been trying to uh, yeah ex explain some of the rights that they have that they don't know that they have necessarily um, and then on a more uh, not abstract level but on a yeah on a slightly more abstract level um, we've published lots of digital works for example things to do with Gaza most recently uh, there was a project that we did a couple of months ago which was the names of the first 6,437 people who were killed in the invasion, this most recent invasion, um, and their names were read by uh, a composited AI-generated voice, which was produced from uh, recordings that we found on YouTube of young men from Gaza speaking about their experiences at the hands of the occupation forces. Um, and then alongside that, there's a, a physical publishing program. Um, we published a pocket book towards the end of last year, which was a series of speeches given by people who had been uh, prosecuted for climate-related offences, uh, who found themselves in this absurd situation where they were not permitted to mention climate change in the course of their own defence, <clears throat> and were then subsequently prosecuted again for contempt of court when they refused to abide by that. Um, so we publish you know, their, uh, their speeches in court in full alongside a, an accompanying essay. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in protest in the sense of uh, things are not right and should be better. That's one aspect of protest, which you know, is viable and generative in and of itself. I'm also interested in using the tools that we have at our disposal already to, you know, produce the world that we want to see in some meaningful way, um, which I think also connects with this very uh, specific historical moment that we're in currently, where the, 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 the imperative to contest the state has returned to a great degree. Um, and I think there is a growing realisation that, you know, the, these people are not our friends, you know, the, the state is not here to serve or to protect us. Um, that realisation has certainly returned to the public consciousness, but at the same time, there are tools and equipment and processes and knowledge available to us which enable us to circumvent some of the things that the state was previously responsible for doing um, and enable us to take action that might not have been previously possible. Um. Okay, I've got a couple of questions that I want to ask, but like I say, feel free if people want to come in to just like wave your hand and we'll get you your own performance microphone. Um, so uh, I want to start off by talking about impact, I guess. Um, certainly having worked um, in the third sector for an awfully long time uh, and in academia um, on the margins, um, impact's a huge deal, right? Like the REF, uh, the Research Excellent Framework for academics, like you have to show impact in the world um, when you're applying for funding. Like if you're making things for charities, we have to show our impact because that's how we get more money in order to, to do things. And um, uh, some of the accusations that get leveled sometimes at protest or particularly art in relation to protest is its impact um, on the world. And I guess, yeah, let's start that as a bit of a kind of like kicking, kicking off point. Um, when, we, when I think about impact and protest, um, I'm thinking about, um, well, like you were just sort of like talking about the state and it's kind of like relationship. And I'm really interested in, you know, we all think about the big marches we've been on going, me and Nick were talking about um, going on the Iraq um, protest march recently. But um, the, a lot of the Palestinian like marches that you have to, uh, the, the changes to the, the rights in this, in the UK, uh, you have to ask permission, like, you know, to go, to go on those marches. So some of that impacts like a bit odd, like if, if you have to put in an application to the authorities to say we're going to march from one bit of uh, London to another bit of London, or they're going to stop you. You know, then how impactful can that can that kind of like be with it, within the permissions? And I guess it's the same around, you know, making art, um, you know, in in relation to protest. So yeah, I wonder if anyone wants to. Yeah, I think um, very kind of related to that is the censorship. That's you know particularly like shadow banning. Um, I don't know if everyone knows what shadow banning is. Um, it's where kind of posts that's happening a lot in relation to, or well, happens a lot in relation to sex workers, um, but also is happening a lot in relation to posts about Palestine. And it's where 
posts are not sort of banned uh, visibly, but they just won't be shown to any of your followers. And that's the sort of blanket thing that's happening um, across in relation to, to Gaza through these platforms that we really don't have very much control on. Um, yeah, impact is, it sort of almost cap makes everything to a sort of capitalist thing that you have to have this product and you have to have this outcome. And I think what I want to add in is the idea of care within that and community and how that is a kind of, uh, can be almost a response to this idea or this need for kind of measurable impact that actually kind of care being nice to your neighbor, being with people on a march, turning up, looking up, sort of that kind of uh, like lesser, sort of not so, you know, not the, the stuff without the banners in a way is what actually keeps things going. And, it, and kind of, and is a very, very strong, I mean, that happened also during COVID, you know, was neighbors taking care of each other that really seemed like the state didn't actually really want us to do that. You know, there was a kind of, you know, COVID was a big data collection uh, episode in a way. And, um, and that kind of care that developed through communities in the, in the absence of the state providing that, I think was very kind of radical in a way. Yeah. I've been really impressed in Glasgow, like um, sometimes when we've been trying to do things, we don't, we don't do the thing that we get to say that we do. But um, there's been some people that I've been working with, they were much more in the activist side than the art side. And um, I think that they just get, this particular person has just been very fluid in being, okay, well, you know, but we still brought, came together. Like we didn't necessarily achieve this one thing, but out of it, more people have come together. There has been more connection, more community kind of like, you know, in that process, which I think is really, I don't know, optimistic when yeah. so much of the time you, you can't help but feel really pessimistic. I add to that briefly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, you know, the, the classic A to B march, like, you know, you start in Whitehall and you end up in, Hyde Park or whatever, and you go and see Tony Benn, and then you'll go home. It's, you know, it's, it's a spectacle, and there is value in that to some degree, and it's, uh, you know, re rehearsing those set pieces, the ritual of it is important. It's also, you know, it's a way for people to salve their conscience, and it's a way for people to turn up and say, you know, I disagree with what's happening, and I've taken action as a result the efficacy of that is you know easy to question i would say and similarly the efficacy if we want to think about it in those terms of in inverted commas protest art i think it's this it's the same sort of principle right it's it's a way of people salving their conscience and there's you know that's that's fine there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but there's a distinction possibly between uh or rather it's important to think about the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and there is a distinction between the spectacle of the A to B march or the spectacle of the protest art and, you know, grassroots action about, for example, with regard to Palestine, preventing the flow of arms leaving British weapons factories, you know. The, there are two uh, orders of action and, or multiple orders of action, multiple orders of outcome, and it's easy to think that there is slippage between them when, in fact, they're quite distinct things I think I guess um, there's slippage as well like uh, I was I was I was reminding myself this morning um, like w one of the pieces of work that I thought was really efficacious was um, in the in the last X amount of time was liberate Tate's um, action to force Tate to declare how much money BP was actually giving them um, and Tate resisted it for years like and the more they resisted it and the more Liberate Tate kept pushing it like when they got to the end I think I think they discovered it was like 0.5 percent over 20 years every year it had been 0.5 percent of Tate's budget like so it was tiny amount that was being allowed and you could see then why Tate was really keen to n not like make that work public what I didn't realize was um that whole movement had come about because um some artists did a workshop at tate and they were doing a workshop about activism at tate 
And they was like, oh, this is all great. Yes, you can go do this. But by the way, you can't criticize the, fu the funders. And so Tate had said, you can't criticize the funders. And then like John Jordan was like involved in this. And he was a bit like, oh, really? OK, let's. And then he put that to the people that were there. And the workshops grew and grew and grew. And he was a bit like, I haven't pushed this. This has come out of this collective like piece. So actually, it would be an interesting to see what would have happened had Tate not said right at the beginning, you can't criticize our funders. But you can see that. But that was a very, that wasn't a, like, we're going to start here and we're going to end up here. That was a thing that kind of like developed over time. And um, certainly Liberate Tate did many ac actions, wrote many pieces, developed in lots of different directions. Um, but that focus on BP, I mean, it wasn't, you know, John Jordan and Platform were not, not going to focus on, on, on BP. But it was just really interesting how that, that sort of funnel had like, you know, developed over, over time. Um, yeah, um, so I guess that's also a thought around the institution, like what, what do we think about uh, the relationship, you know, how as artists or, you know, trying to kind of like engage with activism, can we do that in relation to the institution or, you know, how, how does that sit? Um, I, it, it seems increasingly difficult to make a case for uh, radical participation in institutional forms. And I think there are several reasons for that, the, the, the base of which is the, you know, the recuperative abilities of capital or whatever system it is that we currently find ourselves in. Um, part of the reason that radical art has, you know, failed or has become less uh, meaningful as a site of contestation is because capital is incredibly good at recuperating radical things and, you know, the hippie movement is obviously the classic example of that. But what we see now is forms of, or sort of rehearsals of previous forms of radical art which have been completely denuded of any radical content. Um, equally, what may have been uh, institutions formed with radical ideas or originally staffed by people with radical ideas, and of course are still staffed by lots of people with you know, good hearts and good intentions and all these things, who are operating within systems that completely preclude their ability to make good on those things. Um, and again, as I, so, as I sort of tried to say earlier, we have so many new weapons at our disposal. The relevance of the large institutions is, is waning from that perspective, certainly. Like there's no, or th there is less necessity to participate in those structures if we are also actively trying to uh, change the the things that those structures are trying to achieve. What would you say of the weapons? So what, what would you kind of like? The... Or the key weapon, do you think? I mean, I don't want to, there, there's, it's very easy to become like, oh, a decentralization bore or whatever, but <laughs> there are many, many new digital technologies which are enabling new forms of organizing, new forms of activism. Um, the levels of literacy about uh, privacy technology are increasing quickly, um, actually alongside the development of those technologies. Um, the evacuation of people from major cities, especially London, to places with uh, more available space, places that are less surveilled, um, places that are not um, geographically arranged to prevent assembly or to make it more difficult. All of these, all of these sort of uh, yeah, social and technological changes are combining to produce a a lot of you know advantages and potentials for people who are interested in changing the world that we live in, but also points of danger for um, you know the flow of capital or whatever it is. You know, there's lots of uh, yeah, there's there's, there's points of potential failure in the system that can be more easily exploited, I think. And I'm thinking of, like, um, in Scotland, uh, in Glasgow, um, there's the art workers, um, art worker for Palestine, um, 
like accounts and they're doing a whole thing which they've got a solidarity index um, and so um, I you know I work for marketing I work in the third sector like you know when Black Lives Matter happened like there were so many charities that decided that what they were going to do was put a black square on Instagram which they were immediately lots of lots of people from within the Black Lives Mo uh, Matter movement were like what like what does that mean what are you what are you saying you're going to do and so um, with um, the art workers um, solidarity index what they do is they're looking at um, art institutions in Scotland that have said that they've signed up to Black Lives Matter um, and then also those that have um, criticised um, the, the Ukrainian war but have been notably silent on, on Palestine and so um, yeah like they're kind of like holding people to account like if you're going to say these things you're going to try and put it in your policy what, what does it mean like you know what does that actually look like and what, and what are you saying and I think turning that kind of like system on itself is like really interesting. Yeah, I, I sort of, yeah, totally agree with all that. And I think I also want to bring in, you know, sort of the whole thing that's happening with the universities right now in this country. You know, they're pretty much falling apart. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got people being paid loads of money at the top and fire. I mean, I'm at Goldsmiths and there's a huge, there's a two week strike ha happening from tomorrow for two more weeks because they want to make a third of all academic staff redundant, which means many more because most academic staff are on very incremental uh, contracts. And there's also, but also all the, um, Palestinian solidarity camps and this week I've been to this is my third sort of conferency thing this week I was in Sussex where there's a very uh, kind of active liberation zone liberation square they're calling it and I was at SOAS on Friday um, and I don't know is there a, is there a um, Palestinian camp here in Colchester does anyone know no but um, I mean it is yeah and so what's happening in the universities but I want to talk about also is the rise of kind of alternative art schools which are released from you know lots of these kind of constraints of you know even learning outcomes these sort of clunky things that have come in partly in response to the kind of uh well capitalization really of, of of education that everything has to be measurable you know the timing i mean when i went to my undergrad we had so few contact hours and it was called reading a degree for a reason that you basically spent most of your time supposedly in the library um you know, now it's like the number of hours is sort of the me of contact time is what what is measured as being a good education. So all of these things, there are there is resistance actually where I met you, Josh, was actually on a kind of alternative, um, a symposium about alternative art education in Great Yarmouth that was really actually hope-inducing and inspiring. And, um, you know, many of my colleagues who are working kind of in, ac in academia um, are kind of slightly losing hope in that and I've been thinking about alternative art schools for a long time so I think there are these kind of modes and that is about coming together that is about collectivity that is about inter, sort of interdisciplinary kind of um, intersectional forms of solidarity and, and resistance to these because they're all interlinked all of these struggles as we know yeah. I think that's um, my last uh, big job. I, I'm currently working for a refugee charity, but before before that, I was working for a human rights organisation, um, and uh, uh, that we were trying to change the narrative on human rights using journalism. And as a result of being really involved uh, in the journalist community, it's been fascinating to me about how many because of the big changes with journalism and like how, how much the the mainstream media has been impacted, and journalists have lost their jobs. And what and what they've tended to do is that now we've got over 120, I think. Um, what they define as hyper-local um, publications. So, like, journalists have kind of gone home, they've gone back to kind of, like, where they're from, and they've started up newspapers in those spaces. And sometimes this has got, like, um, you know, publication, like... Um, sign up of I don't know 100 people like some of them are on Scottish islands or like you've got you've got areas in London like Roman Road there's like a newspaper of Roman Road you know what I mean like you've got these tiny kind of like spaces and it becomes an opportunity to do something different to tell different kinds of stories and that again it's kind of going back to this point about I don't know where the hope lies to me anyway it's like in that sort of local community and making a difference in those sorts of spaces yeah. I actually just wanted to pick up on the idea of alternative art school, if I may, if that's okay. Um, obviously that is going to be a form of protest against the current structure. I'm a, I teach in uh, UAL, so we have the same problems, although, you know, it's quite... I, I wanted to know <clears throat> what kind of structures you've thought about, if you've got that far, and... How, how do you see that being slightly different from 
the mainstream, I mm. guess. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Like hyper-local, kind of really embedded uh, in the local communities, but also ecologically, um, but also operating in kind of nodes. So you could have kind of a node in Berlin, a node in like Felixstowe or somewhere like that, which is where I partly live. Um, and also, really importantly, I think intergenerationally, that, that we need to have more intergenerational kind of interaction and conversation. Um, and, you know, in terms of the kind of climate crisis, like hyperlocal is so important as well. Um, and to kind of remember, you know, there are such differences between places. And I think we've sort of the, the kind of internet global sort of village thing has made us unaware of that. And that's what we need to kind of that needs to be okay you know these differences alongside it and then also just you know this sort of again the need to have I mean what we need to ask the questions what is the point now of a degree you can't even get a job you know there are no jobs really there are no jobs for life there are no it's, it's so difficult even with a PhD you know you can't it's very hard to get any work so really just to bring back the real kind of reason for ask people why they're learning what do you want out of learning you know what does it do and think about well it brings people together it creates conversation it makes you able to kind of um, you know find the nuance between things like it, it's, it can be in response to the polarization that's happening partly because of social media and hashtag culture and things so that's that's sort of what I've been thinking about and um, and you know just artists and also I, I did run a little art school in Berlin I set one up for, uh, with Julia Bell who's a writer um, based at Birkbeck and for a f about three years we ran just writing and photography workshops in Berlin um, and we found that also in terms of the sort of financial model you could charge students very little money and still both of us be paid really quite fairly and also pay for the venue so it's just when you remove all that kind of clobber of the institution you can actually have so I'm at the stage where I'm sort of interested in finding people that I could who can are better at figures than I am but the, I think one thing that the charging for universities has brought in is people now do expect to pay uh, which you know when I was did my undergrad and it was all free we didn't so people can but but it is possible to do it in a much more ethical way much more community engaged way and student-led and, and unhierarchical as well so the same people will be in classes will be work, running a workshop and that sort of thing so yeah that's what I've been thinking about <laughs> anybody else or has anybody got uh, an amazing protest they were involved with or an amazing art piece that made them think about politics in a different way was anybody out the battle of organ Oh, God, I, I, I would love... If you were, then I will re-engage my uh, PhD for research. So, oh, about all grief. Oh, yeah, um, so, um, yeah, it, it is an amazing piece, um, and I, uh, I'm, I've been obsessed about it for an awfully long time. Um, but, yeah, all grief was a key battle between miners and police outside of Sheffield. I um, can't remember the exact date, 85, 84. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it was oh, this weekend. Um, so it'll be 20 years ago this weekend then that, that um, Della did it. Um, but, yeah, so he... Della decided to um, put forward a number of ideas to Art Angel about different things that he could do and came up with this, and they decided to go for it. So they did a reenactment on the same site and they involved reenactment societies. And reenactment societies, for those that don't know, tend to be full of quite, um, well, people liking, to, you know, getting together over a weekend and restaging, you know, um, royalist fracas, you know, in, in full costume, um, or, um, you know, Confederate battles, like, based in the UK. So, um, a particular kind of person will get involved with that. And Dylan wanted to, he wanted to kind of like upend that process. And he wanted to introduce that kind of person to the kind of battle that wouldn't get put on by a reenactment society. That was like the aim. Um, and so he, they did it and they filmed it. And so Mike Figgis uh, filmed it. Um, although he wasn't the original director. I still haven't been able to find out who the original director was, but they, that person pulled out and then Mike Figgis did it. Um, and they got a reenactment society to kind of like run it. So my main interest in the end of it was that lots of people have written about it as being particularly authentic because miners were involved in the setting up of it. And um, I put this to Della at one time I met him and he said, oh no, that didn't happen. 
And then I was like, what? Why did I think that? And I went back and I looked and read lots of accounts which said miners had been involved in the, in the creation of the narrative, but that wasn't really the case. And then I went and I wanted to unpack it and look at the process. And so um, I did that often by talking to the people that put it together, so Art Angel, the Reenactment Society, uh, Mike Figgis. Like, I tried to talk to everybody, and then I tried to talk to the audience. And so um, I thought the audience's memories of that piece would be really amazing, and they were. And I didn't get as many people as perhaps I would do even today, like, um, to speak to. But, yeah, like, um, yeah, I didn't ever get to talk to Jarvis Cocker. He, he was there as an audience member, but... Uh, yeah, it was it was it was an incredible piece. I don't know how many people have seen a film of it. Quite a lot of people in the room. Okay, good. Um, yeah, now Della puts it together like not as the film, but he does it with a, an archive as well. So um, whenever it gets staged, it gets put on with the archive outside the the the, the film. But I think the also the idea of reenactment as mm -hmm. as a form of protest and repetition obviously is like a you know the repetition of kind of slogans that keep coming back you know as as things like you know the abortion rights and things like that that kind of you know are people in their 80s going are we really protest this this again is this happening but in terms of also performance and performance art and kind of um actually I was in a talk by Lois Weaver last weekend and who said that actually reenactment is, is a form of documentation as well. And when something's documented, then it kind of remains somehow in history. So it's, yeah, so, yeah, I just wanted. It's quite interesting as well, like, um, some of the processes, like, um, so the ACT UP um, protests um, around um, HIV in the States were the die-ins, right, outside um, the White House. Um, and then that's what Nan Golding, who, you know, obviously remembered the dying in the original time around, would having around the opioid crisis protests that she was doing um, in relation to the Sackler family. I think coming back to what was just being said about the Battle of Orgreave, it's one of the things that interests me is the idea of, like, creating counter-narratives. So we have mainstream narratives. I mean, what would, to me, be the most efficacious development out of the Battle of Orgreave would be if those reenactment societies kept doing the Battle mm. of Orgreave like they might be keeping on doing the Battle of Edgehill uh, or, or whatever battles that they keep, um, you know, they, they, they keep reenacting. And so I think one of, the, one of the things that art can do as much as anything is be able to sort of reinsert things into the archive which get overlooked or, 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 or somehow get overwritten. Um, and, you know, that, that's one of the things I was trying to do with the, the Jubilee project I did about, well, originally about the, the Jubilee in 2012 and then the one in 2022. And you have this mainstream narrative around, you know, royalty in particular, from my perspective that I was looking at. And all the counter narratives get so buried that you have to seek them out and then, as I say, try to reinsert them in the archive through making work about it, through showing it to different audiences. And I suppose that to me feels where the efficaciousness of protest in relation to art can be located. I don't know if anybody yet wants to speak the, to that. The Durham Miners Gala is a really good example of that, that it's a ritual and a tradition that is valuable not only for the event itself but for the meaning that it holds for the generation of people who uh, who experienced those horrors the first time round and also as a way of transmitting information to new generations of the left, right? And the, the old left, the established left, the union-led left, is actually really good at that stuff. Um, there's, I think particularly there's an artist called David Jakes is based in Liverpool, whose practice is partly um, studio-based image making, and then is also partly constructing banners for trade unions. Um, and there is no real distinction between those two parts of his work, and they are equally artistic practices. They're not, you know, the latter of which is not necessarily seen or recognised as such outside of the union movement, but it's you know, it's a creative artistic practice which has, um, you know, m it, the meaning is very explicit and perhaps that's why it's not immediately recognised as 
art, in inverted commas, because there is, I guess, something to do with, um, we were talking about this earlier, but there's something to do with obfuscation and um, a, an oblique look at things, which I guess characterises our general thought of visual art. Banner making is not that, placard making is not that, but it is an incredibly effective way of transmitting meaning. Um, and yeah, those rituals matter, they're important. On the other hand, it's equally important for us to think about tactics that suit the task at hand. Um, and the, it's very easy to become caught up in reenactment in every sense, whether that's A to B marches, whether that's banner making, etc. And to think that that is the sum total of our engagement, our, you know, our engagement with politics or with the societies in which we live, I think formulations as opposed to rigid structures is a good way to approach these things. I think flexibility and fluidity of, of, uh, of form and of thought is positive in every sense. Um, and I think that trying to excavate the, the, the thing that we're trying to achieve through all of this, as opposed to getting stuck up on the form, is, is important, is what I'm trying to say. I think as well, like, like I don't know, coming back to a couple of the same sort of like ideas, but um, when I was doing my research around um, All Grieve, I did one big event um, at, um, what was the theatre? I can't remember. There was a theatre in Leeds, and um, it was like a music hall theatre, and we um, we staged, we did a screening of of, of All Grieve, and um, because it was in Leeds, I put out, I tried to put out on the radio and say it's going to be on, it's going to be free, just like you know, if you want to come. And so we got, um, we did get it on BBC Leeds, and um, a lot of miners kind of like came, um, and all of them wanted to talk to me afterwards, um, and they all had their story, you know, around their involvement in it, or their like partial involvement in it, or m remembering kind of like being involved in it. But there was one guy who really stuck out in my head. Really, was he said that, um, you know, it, it was a terrifying event. Like I, you know, it's been on television, but. Um, Tim Etchells, who's, a, uh, who, who, who's one of my favourite um, artists, he works in live art and false entertainment, and he was there and he was involved and he played a minor on the day and he wrote about it and he said that afterwards, like, how terrifying it was, even though he was, you know, it was performance and reenactment, it was all safe, like, but running from a, a horse and, and a policeman on a horse charging down at you was absolutely terrifying and... Um, I've, I've got such a memory of one miner at that event who came along and he said that after that day, he'd been 19 that day at Orgreave and he'd never been involved in politics again, right? So it was kind of like the thing that they set out to do that day, they, it worked. Like they, they shut things down, they frightened people, they made people not engage. Um, and so I, I was kind of like really interested that this was a moment that allowed that person and allowed the miners in the film, you see that, you know, they're part of the reason they probably got involved, or I certainly know that part of the reason some of them got involved was to come together, right? To have this opportunity to come together a bit like they do at Durham, like to speak, to speak to each other, to remember, to, to tell each other stories, to have that sort of like, you know, engagement. And even though it's not actually in the film, um, after the event, um, they had like a fair, like, um, so yeah, Mike Figgis didn't include it, but like at one point you see the miners um, marching with banners and they're marching to a fair and they're all there and they tend to, you know, they go to the, like the working man's club afterwards and they, and they, and they hang out. And that was also a point of, of the day really, was that, that reconnection, that community coming together, that sharing of those narratives, like, you know, for, for families that weren't there, you know, um, right at the end of the film, there's like a little girl who's singing, the miners united will never be defeated, right? And um, I think that's like, you know, figures focuses on it, but it's about that handing it on to a new generation or like re-engaging those stories, especially stories that um, people had been frightened to tell at the time, like um, that sort of reactivation. It's a therapeutic activity. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. compared with France or Germany, is we are so centralised and London is so dominant. And the fact that all these local people like 
Sheffield with the steelworks and the miners, um, the fisheries in Lowestoft, you know, here in Colchester, the agriculture, uh, areas had far more identity in those days than, and you're talking now about reenacting memories of being strong as communities. We need to be, we need to have more political um, agency locally um, as they do in the German lender or in France every single community has its own mayor and I think we are so disempowered and so uh, alienated, really, and I think that's what brought about Brexit, actually, the feeling of being ignored. We are, like, completely habituated to losing, I think. Like, we've, we assume that at every turn we will lose, and part of the reason that we assume that is because it's right. You know, the, the last 40, 50, 60 years has been one catastrophe after another, and the scale of the loss that this country has, has suffered or that parts of this country has suffered, because it is certainly not either, you know, uh, it's, it's not equally spread either geographically or class-wise, is it, very significant. Um, and there are so many things that we now take for granted as daily parts of our lives, which are just not... They're very difficult to accept. I think particularly of... Um, this has just come to me, but when the Olympics was held in London in 2012, I was living in Stratford, at the, well, I was living in Hackney Wick at the time, so just over the road from Stratford. And the extraordinarily rapid securitization of that part of London was, you know, understood amongst people who live there to be a precursor of what was to come for the rest of the country. And that is exactly what came to pass. The, the level of securitization throughout every part of public space in the UK is now so high. And our, our rights to be in public space is almost entirely contingent on somebody else's goodwill, whether that's the state or whether it's whichever private company owns the ostensibly public space that we're standing in. The it, part of the effort that I think we need to make collectively now is to remind ourselves that there are um, meaningful things that we can achieve and one of the things that maybe frustrates me the most about um, the, the protest discourse is we are constantly reactive. You know, we're constantly on the back foot. We're constantly trying to stop something that has essentially already happened, something over which we have very little control because the decision has already been made. And while the, while the process of engaging in an antagonistic way with the state or whoever else it is is still crucially important it's also beholden on all of us to try and you know ma make the world that we want to see and we are able to do that i keep saying this but we're able to do that in meaningful ways still now and that is made possible partly by technology it's also made more difficult by the incursion of uh, other forms of technology into our daily lives whether that's securitization or whatever else but let's let's stop assuming that we've been beaten before we start, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. There was an essay about this in, I don't know if anybody reads the website, Ill Will. Um, there was an essay by somebody in there a couple of weeks ago, which was, uh, I think it was called Afraid to Win. It's exactly this point, is that, you know, we're not going to achieve anything unless we... Uh, persuade ourselves again that we're actually capable of doing that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, again, that then brings in art, which gives us a space of imagination. And it's really crucial that we do imagine and remember to dream of and, and literally sit down and talk about the worlds that we want. Because like, you're right, you're all, we're always on the back foot. And what's happening in the university, I kind of, that's why, actually, it was the you know, beginnings of that that I was like, rather than wasting all our energy trying to like, stop this happening, which is obviously happening, let's think about alternative ways of kind of bringing education kind of, you know, to people and to us and, and, and embedding it within society. Yeah, and I think um, that, I think it's part of the kind of strategy is to kind of take that space up and it's, you know, in the kind of, yeah, polarization that I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it is very, I know scrolling through Instagram is like, oh, 
oh no, oh great, you know, it's literally, you sort of, you've got the sort of six emoji faces to, to respond to whatever you see, you know, one after the other, you'd go, go through them one after the other. And when, you know, and part of what I'm writing about in my PhD is the, the sort of creation of the blur space about the space of not quite knowing. And that's sort of what often happens within a community setting that you have people with lots of, ideally lots of kind of slightly different views that come together and you kind of sit together with that. And I think that's what, and that's, that's where also being in an offline space, a non-surveyed space, um, and being brave enough again to kind of uh, sometimes be in conflict with people in the room and um, you know not all that we there isn't just one idea that we should all think about that actually what we want is diversity of opinions and, and how we live together better um, but really like the idea of sort of almost speculative fiction that's where you know writing you know sci-fi or whatever can actually be a really important way of working towards a reality rather than a scientific reality of what we want in the future. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm really into, uh, I like your idea of the word, using the word blur, because I think, and also the idea of, you know, being optimistic or at least feeling like there is a chance to change things. Because um, if you look at the way politics has gone, um, although it's terrible, it actually offers an opportunity because you know, that's actually so hopeless. Sorry, I'm also not supportive of Labour either. Um, you know, that actually that is creating a vacuum and it is down to people like us to say, well, what is going to fill the vacuum? You know, because there are certain people that are going to fill the vacuum that we may not agree with. So it's down to all of us to say, you know, I've got a good idea, let's, let's do this thing. Um, and, uh, but I was also interested in what Josh said about um, radical art has failed to make an impact. And, um, you know, I do feel that that is the case these days, partly because things like, you know, feminists were extremely radical in the 70s or even in the 1920s. And so when I see, although I'm obviously, well, I am supportive of women having equal rights, I also feel like up to a point we have actually made huge gains and you know, there isn't always necessary to keep that same level of um, fight up. You know, it is true there's still an inequality. And, um, but, you know, I think there are different battles to be fought, the more important, let's say. Um, and, but I have, do have a question, which is about art and politics and the relationship between them. And um, I sort of sometimes wonder, has... Although I think it's, it's fine to use art for, you know, to kind of express your own um, political thoughts about something, but I feel on the other hand, institutions especially, you know, they'll do different exhibitions about a certain um, issue and you feel very, uh, well, personally, I feel quite patronised when I read some of the labels because it's trying to say, if you look at this art, it's going to make you question the narrative and, uh, you know, it challenges the status quo. And I feel like that's kind of a, a loss for art when you're being told this is the only message you're allowed to take. So I think my question is about... Um, instrumentalism in the arts, where the art, I'm not saying people here have done it, but I feel like there's a trend where art is used so much for other things that we lose sight of the, the essence of art, let's say. I think the, there are lots of curatorial um, uh, ticks which are recurring currently. Like, um, the... the there's a sense that, oh, if you use a certain kind of language to frame the work in an exhibition, then it will necessarily become radical just because you say it is. Um, and also that, you, you know, we even have an understanding of what radicalism might mean in a gallery setting or an institutional setting in the year of our Lord 2024, <laughs> which seems uh, just simply not the, the case to me. Um, Another good example of this, I think, is The Barbican, which has, over the course of the last couple of years, put on so many shows like that, or accompanied, or with accompanying text like that, and then, for example, six months ago, cancelled a talk with Pankaj Mishra, one of the world's leading public intellectuals because of his stance on Palestine. The, and I understand, of course, that you know large institutions like The Barbican, whoever else, 
there are multiple arms of those organizations and they're not all talking to each other and there's different people with different priorities. But it kind of comes back to the point of what benefit can there be in the longer term of continuing to engage with institutions on that level? Um, and also, yeah, like the, the, there is no compulsion or necessity for art to be political, you know, both in inverted commas. And it happens that, we, you know, we're, we're at a certain period in the cultural and also economic political cycles where it, the, it's, I guess, most of the public work that's being commissioned that maybe the people in this room are going to see on a regular basis is made by people who are either participating in or adjacent to radical groupings of some sort or are attracted to the aesthetics of those groups. It doesn't mean it's um, inherently political or inherently radical. It also doesn't necessarily mean it's good or interesting art. And those two, th you know, there's not, there's not necessarily a crossover between those two things, I think. I do think that some of the um, issues around the cultural identity landscape have changed, how like um, things are being commissioned, the kind of artists that we see. And even though sometimes it's, um, you know, they're still marginalised, I, I, you know, I am really appreciative of starting to see different kinds of stuff, do you know what I mean? Like, and different kinds of people getting kind of like placed. And um, that's really important. And I think that's really good to see. So um, their work might not necessarily be political. And I think that actually it's important that, you know, um, it's not p placed on those communities to, to speak in those ways. They, actually, they can make the work in, like, in all the different kinds of ways that, any, you know, any kind of like um, more privileged, um, you know, white cis um, artist has, has sort of been in. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I just almost wanted to bring it back to what you started with, which is, you know, protest as a form, as a way of sort of ex exploding conversation. And I think, you know, ideally art can also do that. Perhaps exploding is too kind of <laughs> maybe too loud, but it needn't be, you know. So, yeah, so that's really what I was thinking about, just how... Yeah, and I agree that when things are too pinned down, I think there is definitely something happening with the institutions that, that is the same as the Black Square with Black Lives Matter, this kind of fearful way of talking about everything, that everything has to be read into everything in a way that's very much like the moment. You know, it's like you curate in the present or, you know, you're archiving in the present, but you're kind of... It's, it's almost like the present is so dominant right now with these various things that almost already feel out of date and also do feel quite patronising sometimes. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, you don't have to read the labels, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, or write your own. <laughs> um, we're sort of getting to the end of this talk, so um, I think we're going to probably wrap it up. But um, these conversations can carry on. Um, there's certainly Sleuth um, and Carl put a lot of stuff on Instagram, like connecting with everybody like let's let's follow and continue some of these conversations um, there's a little break and then there's another talk in this room about funding and art and the vernacular of those things yeah in about half an hour so but thank you everybody